The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So, we want to maximize time today, um, both to make sure that we're doing all of the, uh, all the all of the presentations get good feedback, um, but also so you have time afterwards to make some changes. So, um, if you haven't signed in yet, come on down and sign up while I talk. Just get that out of the way really quick. Um, schedule for today is we are going to probably be done with rehearsals by 2.30. Um, after 2.30, we are going to have um, Luke from OpenCourseWare interviewing teams and producers from teams about the class. Um, so we're thinking about how many minutes per, per team? Uh, it's not too long, 10, 15, casual chat. Yeah, casual chat. Um, it's optional, but I would appreciate it if, if at least people who did production and Scrum Master roles um, would talk to him. But it could be the entire team talking with him and maybe one or two people dominating the conversation. That's OK. Um, the goal for this is for people who are looking at the OpenCourseWare site, um, particularly teachers um, who might want to use these materials in their classes, to find out from the, the student perspective what, what students got out of the class. Um, because it's kind of like student evaluations, we're going to be out of the room for that period of time. Um, so that means after 2.30, we're out of the room, Luke's doing interviews, and your teams are doing whatever teamwork you need to do to get ready for um, the demonstrations and presentations on Wednesday. Whatever you say to the camera, we will not even get a chance to see it before we give you grades. So you can, you, you, you can wail on us if you'd like. Please do. Um, or at least please be honest. <laughs> let's, try, let's try for that. Um, I should also note student evaluations are available online. Please fill those out. Um, we're going to actually, it's a great period of time from three to four in class today to just open up your browser and fill out your student evaluation right here and now so that you um, get that out of the way. And again, those, that feedback is going to be really helpful for us. It's going to change how we teach the course um, in the next year. Um, we change it every year based on the feedback we get from students. So topics you thought you wanted to hear more about, topics you thought we covered too much, whatever feedback you have for us, uh, do let us know. Um, last little um, announcement, we have a guest here, Lee. Uh, from Odyssey Magazine. It's a kids science magazine for kids age 9 to 14. And uh, we're doing an edition devoted to gaming. And um, I'm writing about the MIT Game Lab. And your teacher Grace has allowed me to come and observe you guys as you rehearse your presentations. And I'm going to be taking some pictures and I might ask some questions. Um, I have some photo releases I'm going to need you to sign if I can use your photos. So I'll, put, I'll pass this around. The good news is if you don't want to use a photo of you, don't sign it. Because um, I can't, I can't use your picture with that. So that's just an easy way to handle that. Um, so I'll pass these. Just going to move little piles of these around. And if you would, if you're willing to let me use your photograph, um, go on up. Okay. All right. So um, for our our um, order of presentations, just for today, not necessarily for Wednesday. We'll figure out the actual order by the end of class today. Um, we're going to start with heat wave, then hello waves, then snap then saving Gora Gora, then cholera control. Um, what we're asking you to do is come up, plug in the computer that's going to be used to demonstrate your game, and make sure your game works on the, on the projector. The display resolution, the native display resolution, is 1280 by 1024 if you're doing a 4.3, or 1280 by 768 if you're doing widescreen. Um, it shouldn't make a huge difference for your slides, but that might be um, um, a problem for your game. So make sure you're coming up doing a quick two or three minute check to make sure the game works. Afterwards, plug in your, um, pres uh, your, your slide presentation, and we'll just go step by step. Um, one thing I'd like to know from each team is how many speakers do you think you're going to have? How many main speakers do you have in your presentations? So starting with Heatwave, how many speakers do you have? One? Uh, Hello Waves? Two? Snap? Uh, saving Gora Gora? Five. And cholera control? Uh, one. All right. 
So um, for heat waves, hello waves, snap, and color control, actually for all of you, whoever's doing the most speaking, strap this little thing on. Uh, for everybody else, when you speak, make sure you are standing you know, in the normal spot, spot in front of this so that the microphone can capture you. Um, if you have, uh, for, for volume control, it is over here. Hopefully you've used this before. Um, it's set at about midway. Um, take a note of all the different settings you're using when you're, projecting, when you're plugging in your stuff to the projector so we can make things go fast on Wednesday. Um, any questions? All right, take four more minutes in your teams to, to get yourself ready. And Heat Wave, um, please come up at 1.15 to plug in your game. Timing so. Nope, um, so time yourself with the clock. Um, take note of your own time. We're not, in, we're not enforcing time limit right now. We're, we're concentrating on content. Well, hello. Uh, my name is Miriam Prosnitz, and today I'm representing Team Heat Wave. Uh, we made a game about heat waves, not surprisingly, and these are the people on our team. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So first of all, our game was about heat waves, and the main goal of our game was to educate Red Cross workers about what to do when a heat wave was upcoming or was currently in progress. How do you prepare for it? Also, what do you do to deal with it? And while we focused on these goals, our design goals were more specifically usability, play. OK. I, how did I get that far without somebody pointing that out to me? Uh. OK, we're going to start over if that's OK. Do you yeah. mind? Really didn't get that far in, so it's OK. Um, heat waves. Oh, but now I can't see the slides. OK. Um, heat waves. This is our team. Heat Waves uh, is a game to talk and explain to Red Cross workers what to do in order to both prepare for heat waves and also what to do once you're in a heat wave. And that was the purpose of our game. And while we had those goals for our game educationally, our goals overall for the design process were playability, usability, and education. Usability was first because if the game isn't usable, no one's going to use it. Same with playability. If you can't play through the game, then it's kind of useless. And finally, our, our main goal was education, because we really wanted this game to serve a purpose, which was to educate people. For our design process, we did the same process that most of the people in this class did. We started off with brainstorming, uh, then we went into team formation, responsibilities breakdown, and then just constantly updating using Trello and different Scrum features. And I'm going to talk about all of these in a little bit more depth. So first of all, brainstorming. Uh, we started off right on the get-go, drawing on the board. What do we want this game to look like? What are going to be the main parts of it? And we actually settled on a, a somewhat complicated design with the main screen, a dialogue system, and then kind of an options menu. And once we had this, we actually formed our team. This is our team minus, I don't think Joe's in this picture because he was sick that day. Uh, and one thing you notice is we had a team of nine people. So it was a lot of people doing a lot of stuff. So we had to really deal with that. And one way we dealt with that was using Scrum. Uh, we had a lot of emails. But the way we managed that is we learned from previous times that if you have one giant email thread, it gets overwhelming. You don't see everything. So we separated it, had, had, separated it, had a couple different email threads based on different topics and subgroups. And then also we updated our Trello. And one thing we realized really quickly is that Trello is not so good for listing every single Scrum. So you kind of have to have a to-do, a done, and a working on right now, just for future reference. And that's kind of how we organized ourselves later on. And then uh, just because it's Scrum, it's an iterative process, which is the picture. Uh, next, we had a lot of group meetings. And something we spent not as much time in class because we spent a lot of time outside of class. Um, we had a bunch of meetings where we had snacks and we would all just sit around for like three, four hours and work. And those were really productive times for us because it was a time where we, everyone who was there was really dedicated to fixing bug after bug, issue after issue, getting things done. And they were really what made our game come together as much as it did. He's clicking. Uh, so focus tests, we ran four focus tests, and each of our focus tests had a different theme. So once we had our team together and we were building the game, there was different things working at different times. So for our first focus test, we had a low fidelity prototype that was digital, and it was a Python uh, 
game, and we've tested concept. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. The second one, we tested our initial Unity game, and we looked for overarching issues. The third test, we worked on visuals, just how can we emotionally resonate with our audience. And the fourth test was game balancing, because at the end of the day, uh, once you have everything together, it's really easy to ignore if the game is balanced or not. So the first test we ran was a concept of general mechanics. So as I said earlier, our general focus was education. It was our big goal, and we wanted to make sure the type of game we were building could really convey information and teach the audience about something. So if you, any of you played our uh, Python text game, you would remember that you basically had a bunch of people you could choose to talk to. And if you talked to them, you could offer them water, tell them to go inside, and they'd either listen to you or ignore you. And you just went that way in loops until either everyone fainted or everyone went inside. And what we learned from that was, first of all, it worked. People were noticing, OK, I'm going to focus on the drunk guy. I'm going to focus on the, uh, the older person, try to get them water first, because they faint more quickly. And the other thing we noticed right away is something we did to try to make this game more lively is we had fun dialogue. So for example, the, the first uh, quote up there was like a more factual drinking water. Even when you're not too thirsty is important in this type of heat. That's a very true fact about heat waves. You're just supposed to drink more water than you need to. Uh, and then the second one is just more fun, trying to make it more lively. Hide your wife, hide your kids, heat wave. Um, so that's something we experimented er with early on, having fun or dialogue to kind of increase the excitement, excitingness of the game. So the second focus test, we really were looking for overarching issues. And we was our first uh, Unity-based game. So we were working with issues with our dialogue system, issues with how is the playability, does this concept of interacting and thinking about education still work in this Unity-based game? where it's less of like a, oh, there's just these old person or young person. Which one do I choose? Instead, now you have like these figures. And we tested this out a little bit. We found the educational aspect was still coming through, but we had a lot of playability and usability issues. So we needed to majorly revamp that. Quick. Um, so then we got our focus test three, where we focused on the visuals. So once we went through Playtest 2, we realized, OK, we can fix this, a lot of this usability stuff. And now we want to see, can we make this game emotionally resonate with the players and make it feel like less of just kind of like I'm sitting there looking at this red screen, and it's like, ah. Uh, so we had this. And what we were looking to talk to people about was the different characters. Were they still prioritizing in this scene? And it turns out. They weren't because those labels didn't move with the people. And even if the labels had moved, people said the labels were too small to read, they were confusing, really should just get rid of them and instead either add little icons or caricatures of different types of people in order to choose who to help. So those were the kinds of questions we asked. And we actually showed them a sample artwork of a redone homeless person drawing. Uh, and people said that that was a lot more informative. And that way, we didn't have to have like little text that no one could read. So focus test two was three was really about the visuals, and we really redid a lot of our visuals based on that. Click. Sorry, the mouse is a little non-responsive. Uh, finally, focus test four. I think you all probably had one of these. Was just game balancing. We the end condition of our game is basically when people faint. Uh, how many people have fainted? And if a certain number of people have fainted, then we stop the game. And the problems with that was that it was, at first, there was too many people, and everybody was dying right away. And then we instead ramped up the number of people. And then there was an issue where you were fine, you were fine, you were fine. And then suddenly, everyone died on the fourth day, because there were suddenly 100 people, and you could not help them all. Uh, so Focus Test 4 really focused on that and trying to balance the game out. Uh, along, this way, along the way, we made some bad choices. Uh, every team does. And the main ones we made was uh, we decided to depend on external code. And while we thought it would allow us to make a more complicated game, we didn't really foresee how much we would have to adjust ourselves around the external code. You know, it's a two-way street. And so it kind of impeded our progress sometimes. It was added a lot more complexity, things that we weren't expecting. Uh, and then the other thing we made a mistake on, which I would like to emphasize, is we focused on education, which was a great thing to do, but we forgot to focus on fun. 
And one thing we did to compensate for it, as I mentioned, is add that dialogue, that banter that makes something that's kind of dull a little more interesting. But even so, I think one thing that if we went back and we did things differently, we'd focus on fun as the number one priority, along with playability, usability, and education. So ours became a pretty standard learning game as we talked about them. Uh, good choices. We had a lot of group meetings with snacks. Great idea. Turns out people come if you have snacks, just if you were wondering. And then we prioritize. So everybody prioritized, but one thing we had to deal with because we had such a large team was not everyone was available at the same time. So it was really prioritizing not only based on what needed to be done, but even if something kind of had already been assigned, who can actually work on this right now and get it done? And like, when are they going to get it done? So we really worked with that and kept iterating and figuring out based on what needed to get done right now, who was going to do it. Cool. Uh, so the game itself is uh, composed of really three screens, but a couple of them have subcomponents. So the start screen with an instruction screen, the main, uh, the main game, which has the daytime screen and a newspaper scene in it, which is like the end of each day you see that, and then the end screen, just so you can take a look at all of these. So originally, this was our start screen. Uh, our main feedback with that was it was not pretty and it was not informative. So when we redid it, we added an instruction screen, which is actually still having a little bit of bugs with the readability. But what we did was we added a way to, for players who didn't play the game before to find out what they actually needed to do. And then the actual game, the original we had, I showed you on our focus test two and then our focus test three with the people moving but the labels not moving. We really iterated the main game to make that as usable as possible. And our final result, well, this is actually in progress. So one thing we updated in progress that I almost forgot to mention was that we saw in focus test uh, two and focus test three that visuals were really important. And one thing we weren't displaying at all that was very educationally important that pa Pablo actually mentioned was that as people like are about to faint, they usually get sick. If you see one who's, somebody who's about to faint, they'll like start sweating and turn red and all this stuff. And in our game, they just kind of keeled over and died. Uh, so we needed to way to implement that, but we couldn't necessarily like draw a million different character arts. So we decided on the simple solution was just to add a little, uh, that little circle, I, the thing above their heads, you can all see it with the exclamation point. And that was something we did in progress. And finally, we integrated that with a new character art. And this is the final game. I don't know what those squares are. They're not in our game. Uh, but. You can see the people are a lot more descriptive. I think that's pretty obviously that's an old person. You know, they have a walker. Uh, and we had to rely on these caricatures of people, which uh, really worked out in terms of like getting visual feedback when we talked to people. They were much more responsive to this than like labels or even like little symbols. They really liked the art. Um, mouse. Um, and finally, um, not finally, but the other part of our main game was the newspaper scene. And initially, we just had a lot of information displayed, and no one actually read it because they didn't think they could do anything about it. And they also just didn't like looking at it. It was confusing. So we redid that, and so made it a little more visually appealing. And something we did that I didn't mention on the uh, previous slide about the main scene is that we actually added more longer term options. So this was more relevant as you were playing. Because if it was cooler on a day, you could start installing umbrellas. And then you would actually be like, OK, well, it's actually 115 today. So I'm not going to install any umbrellas. I'm just going to try to give people water. Um, oopsies. Um, and then finally, sorry, this scrolled. What just happened? Um, what? Oh, sorry. Sorry, guys. Uh, so originally, at the end of our game, as you can see, there was no end scene. And that's kind of important. So people really wanted feedback as to they didn't just want the game to restart. They wanted to know how they did, you know? Even if it's educational, part of that fun that was something we obviously didn't focus on was just knowing, oh, I actually did pretty well. This many people, like I lasted this many days, or this many people like went inside because of me. And that's because we weren't focusing on fun. We didn't even think about the importance of an end screen, right? So 
when we redid it, we added this end screen, and it tells you how long you survived. So two hours, five days, you can have a sense of how long could I keep it up and make sure everybody was working out well. So that's our whole game. And looking back at this whole process, something we've discussed as a team that we would do differently is uh, passion. So one thing about heat waves, we all thought initially, oh, it's such a cool topic, heat waves, it gets hot. And then we read about it, and it was actually a surprisingly simple phenomenon. It gets hot, people drink water or go inside, and that's about it. There's not really a lot of complexity to the issue. And so a lot of us lost our passion very early on. I think we, if we were going to do this again, we'd somehow incorporate something in addition to the heat waves that would make us more passionate about the game. And the other thing we do differently is accountability. Just making sure that, you know, with such a large team, you have to really keep track of everyone doing everything. We really focused on prioritizing who was like actually a time to give and making sure they got tasks done, which it worked out really well. But at the same time, there were people who sometimes were kind of lost and didn't know where the game was going because we weren't always on the same page with such a large team, you know, nine people's a lot. But it still worked out really well, and I'd say that given everything, oopsies, not again, we did pretty well with it. And if we were gonna do more futures, something we talked about was more long-term options. People liked those, they made it more fun because you had more of an optimization problem if you had more long-term choices. Those were kind of hard to think of because in heat waves there aren't that many. Like you can install an AC unit and then like maybe a water fountain. But we we're thinking maybe we can make this a bigger scope game, add multiple environments so you have more long-term options and really build up the complexity over time so this game can be more realistic of a community as a whole instead of a single environment. And that's really what we wanted to do. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? So, comments um, about presentation. Um, anybody out there? <coughs> yeah, so can you um, load up your game and make sure your game works? Yeah. Um, I don't really know how to Somebody come down here from the team <laughs> and do that. You can answer questions while we. So, feedback on from, from us then about um, the presentation. Um, the main question I had, like, you covered a whole bunch of stuff, which is, which is really good. Um, the, the things we were asking for, what went right, what went wrong, um, you did it in a different format, but you got to it and that was fine, that was good. Um, the one thing I, I'd love more information on, yeah. if you can fit it, is the external code issue. Specifically, what was the external code? Why was it in there? What did you think it was gonna help you with? And then okay. what did it end up, like just a little, a couple lines of just details yeah. about. More specific. More specific, yeah. yeah definitely. I think it's gonna talk about that. And, 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 Really, like, what is it giving you that basic Unity wasn't giving you? Okay. Absolutely. Um, let's see. I like the structure. Uh, as Rick said, you got to everything, but actually the way how you structured it also works really well for all the points that you intended to hit. Um, if we are following this particular order of presentation... Uh, we're not necessarily. We're going to figure out what the order is okay, after who, we do them all. Whoever goes first will probably need to explain who Pablo is. Uh, oh, to the sorry. audience. Yeah. No, 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 no. It's not something that you would necessarily have, have expected. But whoever goes first on uh, Wednesday, if you talk about any of the clients, you have to assume that the audience doesn't know who the clients yeah. are. And different teams had different clients that they were talking to too. So, um, so do just explain. Yeah, we'll introduce. Is. Basically, we're making games about the topic, but your specific topic. I mentioned Pablo. I should say who it is. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. I just, 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 just give him his name and who he is. That will do wonders. Um, I, th th some, something for anybody who's using Google uh, presentations, uh, uh, Google Slides or whatever that thing is called. I think the S button brings up your notes. So if you have notes, I wasn't sure if you were relying on. Um, no, I just wanted to be able to see the slides. That's why I kind of did that. Guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You also get a little preview slide. Oh. So if you hit the S button, you bring it up. Um, also, it has it automatically brings up the Google Drive is using full screen. Click this to you know uh, to to make it disappear. And that's really distracting. So yeah. whoever's using Google Drives, make sure you do that. And you may want to use the keyboard because that mouse was not. It was, it was flipping out. Yeah. yeah, it was. It was not. I brought it for the actual gameplay, but we're not playing the game today. Right. Okay. So recharge and um, 
if it starts to give you that same problem for the slides at least you may want to just avoid yeah, yeah. avoid using actually mirror. putting it in mirror mode too instead of two screens um, would at least give you it. full a full screen version of the slides um, the speaker notes give you a very tiny version of this. Yeah, it's very hard to see actually. So mirroring your screen back and forth will also make it so that you don't ever have to do that. I can email this actually, at least these, these notes. Um, at the beginning of your, of your presentation, if you can just, uh, when you introduce that your game's about heat waves, before you go into the, the things that you did, if you can just very briefly talk about what Red Cross workers have to do in heat waves. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, of course, if, if that's after you demonstrate your game, then that may not be so necessary. But uh, <laughs> just to give the people an idea, just make sure that before you start talking about this is what your team did, just give people an idea of these are, this is what you're going to do in the game. Yeah. And you, can, you, like, you all have a choice of demoing the game before the presentation or after. It's yeah. whatever works best for your presentation. So if you're showing the game first, you may not need to describe this. But if you're showing the game after your talk, then you definitely need to explain that. Um, when you say overarching issues, as a bullet point, that tells me nothing. Uh, it's like, you had a big issue. But um, then later on, of course, you went into detail and talked oh, about dialogue, it was about learning and stuff like that. I think at the first time you introduced the bullet point, say overarching issues, and you said, you know, such as di you know, the dialogue box and the learning, very quickly, just, to, just so that, that that bullet point means something. Um, Rick already mentioned the thing about external code. Um, when, you, when, when you talked about how you swapped your art assets, and you said, talk, uh, we talked to people about the art. Did you mean playtesters, or did you mean your client, or do you mean your team members, right? Okay. They're all people, so which people? Yeah, I'm assuming playtesters based on the context, but yeah. Um, finally, um, this is, has nothing to do with the presentation. Does the game still use Fahrenheit? Did we change that? What was the question? Fahrenheit, I don't think we have changed the it. game, it's still all Fahrenheit? Okay. Uh, you, 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 uh, a bit risky to change it yeah. at this point. Um, you might want to list that on your um, things to change in the future. Maybe just add that in bullet that's point. Enough. Yeah, that, that's enough. I wouldn't touch the code at don't this point. Don't touch the code. Yeah. Please don't touch the code. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, just, just to acknowledge that you know because that was one one of the big pieces of feedback is that only the US uses Fahrenheit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hey, cool from you, sir. I'm not following Philip. He got my points. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. And you guys have a little bit. Yep. So, so make sure it actually plays. Is it playing? So you're going to demonstrate it uh, in Unity rather than as the a web hosted version? We might do the web hosted version, but we haven't done that yet. Okay, cool. We're meeting it. Great. But it looks like whatever you're, you're going to run it in, it's going to work at that resolution. And is there audio for it? Yeah. Okay. Oh, there's some. Okay. So, so at least it's not muted. Yeah. It looks like heartburn. It looks like something bad. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for being first. Yeah. I'll email you the uh, you. the notes. And okay. Hello, waves. Come on down. Okay. So. It's a little light on there. But our game is Hello Waves. It's a game about forecast-based financing that we're developing for the Red Cross. The idea of forecast-based financing is using the idea of forecasts about the future in order to make decisions that are more effective than just reacting to disasters when they happen. So uh, I'd like to show you a playthrough of our game. Uh, should open up. And let me turn on the sound. Oh. So, uh, as I said, hello waves. Here are the instructions. Uh, we would have done a tutorial if we had enough time, but this gets the idea across uh, and uh, designing a, a good tutorial that actually teaches the player well is kind of hard to do in a, a logical flow. So we have these instructions that explain how to play, uh, what the point of the game is, and uh, a couple of tips about how the game works. So if we go into the play screen, you can see something similar to uh, what we showed you a couple weeks ago, where you have all these different toys at their castles. And 
as you go through the days, you'll see a forecast of what the water level is going to be at over time. And so you can see that right now they're gathering candy, the water level change. This character is underwater and so he takes damage. And so what you actually want to do is you want to move toys out of the water so that they don't get damaged. However, they can only move one castle over at a time. So because we didn't think ahead well enough, we'll see that this truck will actually take damage on the next turn because he's underwater. Actually, he ended up not underwater. We got lucky there. But theoretically, he, he would have. And so as you go through it, the end goal of the game is to build a castle. Uh, and so every toy, when they're home, can either choose between gathering candy to feed evacuated toys or building the castle to reach your end goal of the game. And then the idea of the forecast is that you want to use the forecast in order to know how much candy you're going to need over the next couple of days and to use it to know when you are going to need to evacuate various toys from their variously heighted homes. So back to the presentation. Turn to full screen. So we had a couple of challenges in the design process. The first and the major one is really that we were trying to teach about forecast-based financing, which was a bit of an abstract topic. It's a little different than just thinking long term because you have to use the idea of there's some information we know about the future that we want to use to make optimal decisions, or at least decisions based on some idea of the risk that's out there. But we also wanted to avoid things like just pushing a button to win where you have all the information you ever need and there's just one option that you know you're going to pick every time and the game has no thought whatsoever. And we also needed to think about how we were going to communicate the forecast to the player so that they could then use that to make decisions. Uh, one of the problems that we also ran into related to this was that we focused a lot on the idea of forecast-based financing as the topic and then tried to build a game built on top of that topic instead of building a game that used forecast-based financing. So that held us back a lot in the beginning when we were trying to come up with ideas. We also had a really difficult initial targeted audience of policymakers, 50, 60-year-old uh, government officials or people at NGOs who are going to be using forecasts to make decisions of some sort, and it was supposed to teach them about how they can use forecasts to make these decisions. Except this was a really difficult audience because they don't generally play games and uh, they don't have a lot of time to learn about this kind of thing, and so we couldn't really expect to get them to sit down for a long period of time and play around with our game. In order to deal with these problems, we came up with a couple solutions. The first thing was that we had no idea what kind of game would work or would make sense or anything like that. So what we did is we just broke up into group, into our team up into multiple groups and came up with a bunch of different prototypes. Uh, on paper, we had two different prototypes, one that focused on the idea of managing a city and its resources and its response to disasters versus focusing on individual people and how you're going to move them around to keep them safe from the disasters. And then we went into a whole bunch of different digital prototypes, one that was a text-based game about managing a city. We had one that looked like this, where you had two different cities and you were specifying what workers were going to do or when they would leave the city in order to stay safe. And then we would take the different ideas that we were learning from both of these prototypes, combine them together, take things out. And our final prototype actually uses ideas from all of these. Another solution that uh, we kind of got lucky with is when Pablo came to play our game, he told us that we actually shouldn't focus on the policymakers because he wasn't confident that he could actually get them to play the game. And so we switched our target to being grade schoolers, which is why you saw the sort of cutesy art with the beach and the toys. This actually made it a lot easier for us because we could target people who probably had some experience with games or at least wanted to do something fun and would uh, be curious to learn about uh, our topic. So another, um, for our development process, uh, or I can just speak here, right? Yeah, you can speak right in front of that. Okay. So uh, another uh, big issue, we ra uh, another set of challenges that we ran into was through our development process. And so um, we had initially issues with communication and facilitation. Our team had a wide variety of like uh, experiences and backgrounds. Some were hardcore gamers, some mostly mobile gamers. And so there were initially a lot of disagreements on what level of game uh, we wanted to create and like 
what sort of game, casual versus hardcore, that we wanted to create. And so we needed to overcome like challenges of facilitation and communication within our team. Uh, another major challenge in our development process that we had to face came from our design issues, where for a very long time, we had kind of a vague vision of what to do. We didn't know what kind of game we wanted to make, and so we purposely tried to keep our game ideas vague as we built prototypes. But then we ran into issues where um, we would have solutions, but like no consensus on which solution was best, and where we would um, and where we went for long periods of time without having a clear direction of where we wanted our final game to be. So um, our solutions for uh, the challenges proposed by the development were a team structure. And so we structured our team loosely uh, into three subteams, a production subteam, which would uh, take care of uh, production, like the uh, deliverables and making sure that all the uh, game ideas are being uh, communicated properly. A technical team, which um, worked primarily with the code and making sure the game got done. And then a user experience team, which handled art, UI, and uh, sound. And so we kept a flexible responsibility. I, uh, we kept the responsibilities flexible. So you know, as team members got busy, over the semester or as like changing conditions led to different people contributing, um, we kept uh, responsibilities were able to easily flow between teams and team members. And um, additionally, another idea we uh, started with in the beginning was the idea of sub-team leaders, um, which are the two people marked with the L's, but that was an idea we later abandoned in favor of just having a more flexible team structure or flat team structure. Um, another solution for helping our development process was the use of good code practices. And I, I cannot emphasize enough that this really helped speed up our development because of, we didn't run into trouble with code. It was mostly with design. So we used, um, we used Yeoman, which is a JavaScript uh, scout module system. And basically, it allowed our code to be interoperable. We could write one module separately from another module. So that solved a lot of issues with like dependencies or like um, people working in parallel, because it allowed people to you know, work in parallel without overwriting each other's code. Um, we also used good code practice with state machines and MVC, which is model view control. And so we had a very you know, object-oriented code, very modular. And when we did need to you know, uh, change our code, rip it all out, and put it back in, it actually didn't turn out to be too painful, because we just had to switch a couple objects around. Um, all right. And then one final solution that we used for, uh, for our development processes were <coughs> Slack and Scrum. So Slack is like a modernized IRC chat room. And it's very feature rich. It has a lot of integrations with uh, GitHub and Google Drive and things like that. And so that sort of real time communication actually made it so that we didn't really have to meet outside of class too often. Uh, we, if someone was working, we would just email out saying, We're on, I'm on the Slack. And then people could meet on the Slack. And it was full featured enough. Like we could send attachments and things like that. that yeah, most of our communication in-person communication could be done in class. And in class, we adopted a uh, sort of like daily scrum format, where uh, we simply said what we had done since the previous class and what our goals were uh, until next class. Yeah. So in the end, though, we did have to cut some features. Uh, um, these features mainly were the idea of, multi again, mul a tutorial or multiple levels, uh, simply because there would just be too much content that we would need to play test in order to make sure that it like, was of consistent quality and like, got our message across. Um, and also trying to add more individuality to the, uh, to the toys that you saw. Um, they have different graphics, but that's as much as we could do, given the time constraints. And so kind of just bring it back um, and our worst, three worst decisions. 
um, where first we spent a lot of, we did end up spending a lot of time on code and assets that never got used. We maybe like used 10% of our final, 10 to 20% of our final work in our final project. Actually, maybe that is a bit uh, overkill, but um, okay, maybe 30% of our final uh, code and assets in our final project. Um, this really was due to uh, this second bad decision that we kept the game and its direction too vague for too long. We always were holding out that, oh, maybe we'll be able to come up with a better game idea, or maybe we'll find some magic solution to how we can make for forecast-based financing into a game. And because of this mindset, we spent pro probably the first half of the project like just staying too vague. And that hurt us in the end because we spent so much time going in all these different directions. And really, um, really the uh, decision that kind of captures those first two, though, is the fact that we tried to make a game on top of forecast-based financing. So we had forecast-based financing, and we were like, how can we skin this as a game? Whereas once we switched that mindset and thought, let's have a game, and how can we put forecast-based financing into it? I think uh, that was the moment that we then came together as a team and really started making the final game that we wanted. And so our best decision. So, um, yeah. So uh, one of our best decisions was that we chose good tools at the beginning, which meant that as we went through all these different digital prototypes, we actually didn't have to completely rewrite our game. We could pull out the way that workers worked in one game, we could pull out the view that we were using in another game, and then we could just combine them together, and that allowed us to move quickly whenever we were changing our prototype. We also weren't afraid to trust each other, uh, both in terms of what everyone was working on, but also in terms of the decisions that we were making. And so when we said that we had to throw something out, we all understood that it was for the best uh, the good of the project. And we, we didn't have a lot of complaining or hurt feelings when something didn't get put in or when we decided to throw out our assets or code. And when we got to the end, we had been through enough of sort of this vagueness that we were all kind of frustrated with it. And we realized that we had an idea that we all liked and we really got on board with it and made it happen. Once we started working on our final idea, we saw that it worked. Uh, basically, every decision from that point on was how do we make this game better? Uh, and we were all on board with that vision. Thank you. Any questions? Yellow and white. Yeah. yeah, like the yellow and white on your on your early screen. Yeah, I'm always doing this on your special screen. I realize also, that's the game, not the the um, presentation. But wow. <laughs> it's also a little faded in the game itself. It could yeah. be the display resolution you're using. So after after we're done with everything, yeah. try yeah. a different resolution, see if it makes a difference. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, the music in the game demo was too high. Um, it was overpowering your voice. Oh, okay. uh, so, you know, I think you were almost hollering just to be able to be heard. Uh, doesn't need to be that loud, so you can just crank down the volume either on the computer or on, on the controls over there. Um, something that I, that I had a question for, uh, you don't have to answer it today, um, but you might want to put it in your presentation, was how long was the design of what, you've, what you eventually established on the table before you decided that this was the thing that you were going for? Right, because I'm assuming it was one of your vague. It, it came up during your vague idea phase, and you're and you're implying that you were in that mode for too long. But <laughs> I don't know how long it was on the table, or was it only something you figured out at the end of the vague idea phase? Um, because you, otherwise, you wouldn't have been able to switch to this idea if it was not on the table in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and how did you decide? This was it. The the, the Sandcastle game was going to be it. Um, I understand. I, I think you you very clearly explained the benefits of deciding this was it. Mm -hmm. But how did you come to that conclusion? Sure. Was uh, that stuff I wanted to hear more about? But you don't have to answer it now. Yeah, I might also um, just a little bit specificity. You mentioned you spent too long on that design phase. I wonder how long that was. Okay. Yeah. Um, you said Pablo switched your target audience for you. 
um, telling us whether that was because of the game that he saw or because of something else. If you know that information, mm -hmm. throw it in there. If you don't know that information, that's fine. Um, knowing why you, you dropped the team lead, you mentioned you, you dropped it, but you didn't exactly say why. Again, really quick, this is what it, this is, we weren't getting blah out of it, mm -hmm. or the flexibility was more, whatever. Um, and then you had to, oh, um, defining your terms, you're saying things like casual versus hardcore. Give a little bit of definition of what you what you mean by that. Um, it means different things for everybody. So what is your what is your use of that? Yeah, I think um, you specifically said hardcore and mobile, uh, but there are hardcore mobile players yeah. out there. So this is this is like and casual can be considered a version of hardcore just in a different way. So just be really just yeah. be a little bit more clear about because I think you're talking about the target audience and the kind of players and the kind of games they might play. So just be a little bit more more focused on what exactly you you mean by that. Um, that's it for me. So just a technical observation, uh, Yellowman is not really a mod module framework. It's just a system to generate a project and it puts different frameworks. So yeah, just check that. Okay. So that's terminology issue then. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, clear, clear, clearly it worked out for your team. So we're not saying like don't mention your man. It's clearly a good thing, but just check your definition of what it, of what it is. Because, because it'll be more helpful for other people to understand what it is so that they can think about whether they want to use it in the future. Oh, actually, so your demo, mm -hmm. you spent about three minutes doing it. Um, we are going to have you have the, a player from Guardians play your, your game live okay. without doing, or without getting a lot of help. You can talk over it. You can, after a while, start helping them. We, need, we want to see them at least just start playing it on their own. Decide when you're going to put that demo in. You could actually combine them both together if you do it at the beginning or end. Um, but if you do that, give, give the player a little bit of time before you start talking. Okay. Sure. That's all I got. Great. Thanks. Sure. Thank Snap, come on down. All right, hi everyone. Um, I'm part of the Snap team, and this is Sabrina, who will talk about the front end and aspects. I'll talk about the back end aspects. Um, so I think we actually wanted to start with a demo of the game, and we'll do a real demo right now. Um, so could everybody go to snapgame.org? You should uh, turn on your volume as well. Could be interesting to see. Yeah, I can Oh, nice, my screen's hidden. <laughs> and I will also play the game. OK, everybody ready? Who wants to play? All right, so the way this game works is I'll, I'll explain it again in case anybody hasn't heard this before. Um, we're going to give you a topic, and then you're going to enter words related to that topic. Whenever you enter the same word that somebody else entered, you'll get a point, which we call a snap. And the topic is algorithms. And you can cheat by looking at my screen, but please don't. I have no idea how I'm doing. What happened? Oh, oops. I think it's this resolution. Oh, it's the resolution. Probably. I did test this. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I never entered this many words. I can't scroll. All right, I think we're going to stop this one. <laughs> Wow, that was impressive. Justin won. 
followed by Rodrigo and Rachel. Now, this is what you guys submitted. This is a very MIT heavy. <laughs> All right. Domain. Domain, yeah. So much sauce. All right. So that's our game. All right. So. The way we did this project was we split up into back-end and front-end teams from the very beginning. Uh, this was a bit of a challenge for new features because initially we both were really highly interdependent, but eventually it became really nice because it was simpler to manage a front-end and a back-end team individually, and they generally didn't need to talk to each other uh, once the back-end was off the ground. Um, I think that structuring our team with more individual roles besides just having generally back-end and front-end people would have been helpful. Uh, UI design was something that we didn't think about early on enough, and that's why the UI is not as polished as it could have been. We could have had somebody just dedicated to taking information between the back-end and front-end, say, documenting the back-end and making sure that everybody knew how it worked. Uh, we also definitely had problems with paperwork which would have, been, would have been nice to have somebody who was really on top of that. Um, and then the game design as well was something. In addition to UI design, we also could have had somebody just looking at the game and thinking about the core game concepts, things like scoring and what we're going to display to players. We did a pretty good job with planning. We used Asana, and Asana worked really well for us. It was quite flexible, let us manage independent task lists for front end and back end, which we think worked well all the way from the beginning to the end. Um, so separating out the task list we liked, Asana we liked, uh, our project had a lot of dependencies, and this is something that Scrum inherently had a problem with, and our tools also had a problem with. It was hard to know, for example, when a task on the front end and back end were dependent, there wasn't a good way to encode that and see that the back end needed to get something done more quickly because the front end could use it. Uh, we also had trouble just creating tasks. I think that it, there was a diffusion of responsibility as to who would be creating tasks and who would be assigning them. Once the task got assigned, then it went pretty well, but we had trouble just getting all our tasks listed out. Uh, I think the, the core of all these problems was really getting people invested in the project and making sure that they treated it as a priority and um, really, really spent some effort on it. Um, want to talk about this? Sure. So we also use Slack uh, for communicating as a team. And uh, I think it was really helpful. I like the fact that we could have multiple channels so that people working mainly on the front end didn't really have to get all the communication going on with the back end. And then we also had channels for our Asana and GitHub so we could see what was going on with that. Um, some problems, though, were I feel like people weren't as active as they could have been. Feel like maybe everyone should have downloaded the mobile app or at least you know uh, signed up for notifications so that everyone was aware constantly what was going on and if someone mentioned mentioned them in a post they were quickly able to respond and get back to them and yeah that's the main thing that I think we could improve upon if we use this in the future. Yeah, so going a little bit specifically into the back end, what went right for us was definitely our technology. Uh, we used Node.js as the server and uh, Socket.io to do the two-way communication so that you could receive snaps from other players. Um, and we deployed on Heroku. All those three things worked really well. We had no problems with them. Um, and the design of the backend also went pretty well. It's a pretty simple server to implement, um, and we did a good job of figuring out what it needed to support. Uh, we didn't document as well as we could have in terms of what is the published API that the front end should be using. So in socket.io, you send all these events, and the names and the formats of the events were not well documented for a long time. Um, there wasn't a lot that I would change on how the backend was structured and how it went. 
but I think maybe we had too many people working on it for the small amount of work that it was. And it would have helped if people, more people had worked on the front end. Um, that's part of, also part of finalizing and freezing. If we had just finalized and frozen the back end, then we could have stopped worrying about it and just moved on. Uh, networking was explicitly forbidden in the rules of the class, which we did break and we intentionally broke it quite early on. Uh, networking really didn't give us very many problems. We had a couple Heroku issues where we had to quickly do a deploy or there was a bug, such as the one you just saw. Um, but those really, we, Heroku went really well for us and you could easily roll back. Um, and Heroku gives you good documentation on what exactly, what code exactly ran every single time. Um, we actually have been deploying to the client and the client has been using this for a while now. Um, these are some of the tests they've run and you can see that they're, they're quite different in terms of how many teams there were, how long they went. Um, I'm not really sure what the really long games were like. Uh, we'd still need to talk to Pablo about his feedback for those. Um, but indeed, there were words being submitted for those entire three hours. Um, and just to give you a sense, I'd actually like to show one of these word clouds. So these are much more serious topics than algorithms, where actually like, looking at the words will give you a sense of what people are thinking um, about a topic that you care about. Um, so for example, okay, I think I'll just include screenshots of those because that doesn't work very well. Um, so here, the topic of this conference is zero poverty, zero emissions within a generation. And you can see education seems to be a big theme in this conference. Um, I, I can tell that just by looking at the word clouds um, of several of them actually. Um, and a lot of our effort ended up being focused on the client as opposed to the class. I think that's part of what made our paperwork fall behind is that I've been working a lot on supporting these runs that happened in the past four days um, as opposed to the deliverables of the class because I thought that this was important. Um, it's part of why we have snapgame.org. Uh, developing the back end, we were like really successful, but I felt uh, when it came to the front end, we struggled a little bit. I think a main challenge was kind of, you know, the game is a game that was intentionally made to you know, play person to person and have that communication and kind of representing that you know, in a digital game was a big challenge that we had to do. So in our first design, we decided we were gonna use Phaser and look something like this. And obviously Phaser wasn't even really being used. So what was the point? So we dropped Phaser and then we went to just using uh, Bootstrap. Uh, I think, yeah, here we're just using Bootstrap and JavaScript to handle all the input from the users. And then in our final design um, with the, as you saw the dots in the drawing, we're using a JavaScript library called 2JS. So what went right was, I think we had really good uh, people to do UI design, but we didn't really begin thinking about that until later and it took us a really long time to be able to represent the game in a really good way to the user. There were a lot of challenges we faced in doing that. So, you know, I will come back to this. Some of the first ideas that we had for how we're gonna represent the information to the player was by using a word cloud that we use on the back end, but blurring out the words um, until they actually submitted a word that we would display it but this is actually really, really challenging. And so we didn't want to spend our time doing something like that. Then we considered you know, having some sort of line where you're racing against the other players to get to the top, but this isn't entirely interesting. So we considered including both of them, but then again, the word cloud, we ended up deciding that that was too difficult. So we came up with the idea of everyone's a dot and your score would be represented by how big your dot is, but if you're playing with 100 people, this is just unreasonable. And so then we finally came up with this last idea, which is nearly complete, um, where your the height of your dot represents um, where you are in relation to the max score, and the lines are representing snap connections that are going on with the other players. So basically, I think for future projects for the front end, we definitely need to think about design sooner 
you know, this process happened really slowly and really close <laughs> to the end. We were very focused on, you know, uh, the functionality of our game and the mechanics and not a lot about, you know, the player's interaction with the game. It would have been awesome if we did some prototyping early on because we had some other ideas and we just never put them into fruition and we never tested them out. So it would have been interesting to make those and see what users thought of them. Uh, cool. Yeah, so I, th I think working with a large group was definitely difficult and splitting it up was a good idea, but I think that having more responsibility and roles within those people would have been uh, very helpful. We also should have thought about design sooner. I think also uh, from Miriam's presentation, the idea that we should have thought about the game and ha making it fun was something we should have focused on as opposed to just thinking about porting a game that we had seen. Uh, we really should have focused on what makes this a fun game and what can we do to improve it. Because the, the core game can be done very quickly and like within the first couple of weeks we had the core concept done. So I think we more quickly we could have figured out, okay, well what, should, what feedback should we give to players? Uh, how can we make it more competitive, which I think <laughs> makes it more interesting as a game as opposed to as a tool to collect data. Uh, that's all we have. Uh, are there any questions? Class? Any suggestions? No? Okay. okay. Well, we found some. Uh, you want to go first? <laughs> no, um, so, um, looking at the one thing that I noticed was the, the uh, some of the, there was a screen where you had the worked didn't future. That made no sense to me at all. I stared at that slide for a okay. while, and then I heard what you were talking about, and then I, ah, oh, what worked, what didn't, what are we going to do in the future? Um, I can see how you might do it, because it kind of fits with the snap theme of having just a single word, but wow, that was, that was really <laughs> confusing. Oh, that's why all the subheadings are in small letters. Yeah, okay, it took me right. a while to realize what was going, I'm guessing okay. that, I don't know for sure. <laughs> Is that what you were going for? Not but really, it's just okay. for consistency. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, slightly more clarity would be helpful. <laughs> um, you talked about the task diffusion and having a hard time getting tasks assigned. What was, you, but you didn't really talk about, when you talked about dividing your team into groups, you didn't really talk about what the structure was, running those groups or anything. And maybe you didn't have any and that was what was going on, but you might want to be maybe more explicit about that. Yeah, like how did somebody take a task from a Santa? Yeah. By the way, like, yeah. it, was there a process for that? Did that actually happen that way, or was it an assignment? Yeah, was there one person generating tasks, or did the group sort of generate tasks collectively? That sort of thing. I think that's most of what I have. Well, um, so, uh, first of all, the, the, the demo for the game probably is what we're going to have to do on the real day itself because it's such a large scale game. Yeah. So it's not going to be like two people playing the game. So we can probably run the, the demo pretty much the way that you did. That's, that's what yeah. Is that the way that they, they do it when they, when they run it? Um, it depends. So Pablo has been actually doing like a limited number of words. Um, and only at the World Bank are they doing it like the way the way we're doing it, where it's just like everybody submitting, and that they haven't done yet. That's actually this afternoon. You you might want to um, talk a little bit about the history of this game. Everyone in this room right now has played the oh, original true. game. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, similar to to some of the things. I, I mean, I have it. All, why are all your subheadings in small letters? Because it really really threw me. Um, now uh, maybe it was not intended, but uh, to make it look like your game snap, but it yeah. actually does make it hard to read your sure. your, your slides. Um, all caps will be even easier than all small letters. Um, when you st there's one slide where you talk about adding roles for like specific like game yeah. design UI and everything, but the heading just says future, right? Uh, okay. It's like sure. the the big takeaway is more specific roles. Yeah. You'll yeah. see it, yeah. So that should be on your slide. Um, <laughs> Your slides move really fast uh, on, on average, and some of your slides are more word heavy than others. Okay. So for the ones that are word heavy, leave them up a little longer or make them less wordy, um, one or the other. Otherwise, I'm trying to read everything and I can't even listen to what you're saying sure. before the next slide changes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when you describe the mobile app, uh, I'm assuming you meant um, Asana mobile app? The Slack, oh, the, Slack. Slack. Yeah, the Slack mobile app. Yeah. Okay, 
Yeah, just just be specific because it wasn't entirely clear what you meant by uh, that. Um, so uh, yes, put screenshots into your presentation instead of switching windows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just that would just make things easier. Um, there may be people in the audience who actually haven't used Phaser or know what Phaser is. So when you say uh, <laughs> Phaser clearly isn't doing anything useful, well, they don't know what Phaser does. So that so just explain. Phaser is a sprite-based game engine. We have no sprites. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, two two points uh, uh, about the game itself. Uh, first of all, um, how can you tell which dot is yours? Uh, uh, Okay, I, I think because of the peripheral vision, I really could not, did not even notice that it was a green dot. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe it's just my eyes or something, but I just... I, was... I didn't see it either. Okay, how, how, yeah, how, so how many people actually notice a green dot? Because mine was so small. Okay. <laughs> okay, there is a green dot on screen. It's really hard to see a green dot. I thought, uh, there's a, something about the way how human vision works uh, on that. Yeah, so I think it's also because the there are so many people. Yeah. Like we have we have never tested with okay. more than five people and yeah, there are like a lot of dots on screen yeah. when there are I don't know how many people were in that game, but like I think it's cool that there is a dot that is yours and that it has a meaning to it, but just being aware that that dot even exists and is different from the other dots is more challenging than you might have realized. Yeah. Um and then uh, finally, um, one thing about the networking thing is actually really, really neat that Heroku and Node seems to have solved problems that we traditionally in this class have just like derailed entire teams. So, mm -hmm. so it's possibly that you just got, you just have an awesome team. Uh, yeah, I think one thing I forgot to mention is that we have a lot of experience in all of these technologies, and so that helped. Yeah. yeah. What what happens if somebody who doesn't know anything about Node.js or Heroku app decides yeah. they're going to make a networking game? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you might want to talk about that. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, mine um, to to reiterate. Yeah, client support versus class deliverables was a good was a uh, a good point. Speak about more about the client the client and what you what you did uh, for them and and how what their role was on the team. Um, it sounds like they were, they had a more active role. Um, and dependencies, when you talk about dependencies and, and Scrum having difficulty with that, um, absolutely true. What did you do to get past it? Explain that. Or if you didn't, if you didn't do anything to get past it, say that. But say whatever it is that you, sure. rather than, you do a lot of loss does, does this, but you don't go into the how. So go a little bit into the how for, that, for at least that point. All right. Thank you. Uh, no, let's just hammer through them. All right. Um, Saving Gora Gora? Saving Gora Gora, come on down. So, we're the uh, Saving Gora Gora team, us plus you know some devs in the audience. Um, and I'm Liz, and I'll be starting off, starting you guys off. Um, so, a quick overview of our game's goals um, coming into the project. We wanted to inform players about a cholera. Um, and specifically the causes and the symptoms and the prevention of the disease. And our audience, um, we wanted to narrow that down really early. Um, specifically, we were more interested in targeting uh, the younger age range of 8 to 13. Um, and we had specific uh, issues with that, which we'll talk about later on. And mainly we wanted to have all these education goals and um, audience goals be, be a part of the, a fun game, basically. Like, we wanted our game to be fun, not one of those educational games that you play and then you fall asleep, and it's basically a poster. Um, quick overview of like what the game uh, ended up looking like. This is Saving Gora Gora. It's a children's game, and you are visiting a village of, of animals, which is falling ill. And as a player, your goal is to help figure out what is causing the illness and trying to um, defend a character in the game, which we'll talk about now. A big part of our game is narrative, um, which is why we're going to do the demo later, because we want to ease you into the narrative without having you read all the text. Um, everyone in Gora Gora is sick. We have this monster that is being blamed for it. He's totally a cool guy, though, and he wants you to um, help you prove his innocence. You're Kojo. You're a little bunny kid 
and you need to, you know, work with the town to prove to the town that it's not Sal that's making everybody sick, it's actually cholera. Um, basic gameplay is you're, this, you're the main character, this is Kojo, and you'll unlock minigames by exploring the map. Each minigame will give you a clue to prove um, that Sal is innocent, and your ultimate goal is to convince the mayor that Sal is a cool guy and he shouldn't be in that cage that you see in the background. <laughs> so, our first mini game um, was about water filtration, and the basis of the mini game is that friends and neighbors in the village are bringing water to Kojo's mom because they don't know whether it's safe to drink or not. So, um, the goal of the game is to have the player decide whether um, each water source is safe to drink from. And along the process of developing that mini game, we had to actually iterate over the physical design of the minigame quite a bit because our first idea was to make, since it's water filtration, we wanted to make it perhaps a facility. But we realized that wasn't relatable, it wasn't culturally relevant to all the kids who would be playing this game. So then we, our final design ended up being outside of home, as you can see in the background. Um, so a couple other challenges we had. First, we had it working in real time where the player had to rush to get things done in the minigame, but we thought that that took away from the overall purpose of teaching the kids, so we made it a lot more relaxed, a lot less time constrained, and allowed the player to play at their own pace. And lastly, we, we wanted to make sure that the game was clear, the gameplay was clear, but we didn't want to make it too text heavy. Um, and we considered making a tutorial, but we didn't have enough time to actually implement that. So we added some instruction text boxes on an overlay to just try to give the player a brief overview. And then during the game, they're also able to go back into these instructions and reread it. So it becomes more clear. Okay. So the next mini game is um, a water collection game where Kojo, the main player, needs to help his friend find a safe water source since. You have to go look for water and figure out where to drink or where to get it. Um, he help, basically helps his friend choose where to get the water from. Um, so you, there basically shows a village map and you would choose which places on the village map you would want to get the water from. Um, in terms of challenges and how I, like, how I started developing the game, we wanted to make sure it was fail safe so that even if the player chose the wrong choice, then they would get feedback, say they would learn why that wasn't you know, the right choice and then be able to continue playing the game until they made the right choice. Um, originally, we did have an excreta. Um, like you had to find where you would also excrete, but we cut that feature pretty early on since we thought it was less crucial and we wanted to focus on water. Um, and then other challenges were, as Kevin said, we had some like cultural issues in terms of design, so we revamped our images. Um, and also, we wanted to provide more feedback to the player as they were playing. So. Um, I guess throughout our development process, we added things like helper text and more explanations about why you did or didn't do things correctly. Our third mini game is focused around um, understanding the symptoms of cholera and uh, understanding how important it is to act early on these symptoms. So uh, in the game, the doctor of the village, Dr. Akwazi, is very busy and he can't go out into the village um, to help patients because he has so many patients that are coming to him already. So he asked Kojo to go help him find sick patients to go talk to his friends and see if they have any of these symptoms, tell them to come to the clinic so that they can get treated. During the development of this game, we initially started off with the idea that you'd be helping the doctor diagnose patients at the hospital, but then we realized that this would quickly turn into a quiz and wouldn't be as engaging or as fun and would essentially be the same as reading off of a pamphlet. So we wanted to add more of a game aspect to it. So we decided to make it such that you are going out and trying to find people and helping them, um, uh, suggesting to them that they go to the doctor's office. And then we, another one of the cultural things that we ran into is we initially, you're playing as a kid, but we initially had it such that you're going around and talking to some of the adults. And uh, as Pablo pointed out to us, there's a much stricter social hierarchy in Ghana and um, it might be, seem appropriate that we are suggesting to kids that they demand that their parents go to the doctor's office because that's not something that would necessarily happen um, in the Ghana social structure. So we decided to change that around to you're talking to your friends 
who are the same age as you, and then you're, you're talking to your friends and <coughs> having them go to the doctor's office. Some of the challenges we ran into, since this is a uh, very conversation-based game, um, making sure that the dialogue UI was understandable and that you knew um, when you had choices available to you to choose and when you were talking versus the other person was talking. Um, this was something that we had to iterate over multiple times. And finally, uh, making sure that the dialogue was age appropriate. Since these kids don't speak English as their primary language and their children, we wanted to make sure that the dialogue was simple enough for the children to understand, but also still had the meaning behind it such that they realized uh, what actions they were taking through their dialogue. Okay, and uh, now we're gonna start our demonstration. So it starts out with the monster hiding and it asks like, the monster is like, why? Uh, he's hiding from Kojo and Kojo's like, why are you hiding? Um, and so you see like people are blaming him for everyone's sickness. Um, and so you say you'll help and you know who to talk to. Um, but then when you bring him to the mayor, he's locked up by the mayor. And you're trying to convince the mayor that he's not the actual monster. So you can see the beginning dialogue really sets up the scene for the story. And now, as Kojo, I'll say, I don't know, but I'll figure it out. And so now that you're in the town, you can explore the town. And you can see, you might be able to talk to some of the people. Um, and so the people around town will give you things that will help you. So this dog is giving you matches. And you might figure out later, oh, well, and now you see you have matches in your inventory, and you might be able to use that later. Um, so for example, we can also click on the different buildings. And now we realize that your friend is missing a bucket. Um, so you tell him you'll go look for it. And we see that, oh, the monkey has a bucket. Um, um, so then you can get the bucket from the monkey. And then now you can go back and tell your friend, oh, you found the bucket. And so this brings you to one of the mini games, the collection mini game. And you can see you can drag the bowl to different, different locations. And you can also click on the locations to see what, they're, what they are. And you might say, all right, I'm done. But oh, it looks like this water spout is rusty. Um, so that's where the fail safe part comes in. And if you eventually drag it to a good source of water, they'll say thanks. And you've also it, you've acquired a clue. Um, so then the next mini game, as Kevin was talking about, is you have to purify water. Um, and so, as you see, there's a lot of helper text to help you get started. And you can just drag the water, and it says it's discolored, so I think we'll have to boil it. And eventually, the, the, role, the, the game, you have to um, figure out what to do with all the water and collect enough water. Um, and so I think we'll just cut that short since we're a little short on time. And then we'll, uh, we'll show the rest of the game for the final presentation. Yeah, so in terms of like two technical challenges we ran into, uh, the first was like states with phaser. Uh, obviously there are states with phaser, and but we had to find a way to work around um, keeping a lot of like player data in terms of like clues and um, like which games you had completed, uh, what dialogues you were on, which dialogues should show up. So that was something uh, that was a little bit of a challenge, but that we figured out. Um, and then additionally, balancing difficulty with accessibility. So we kind of mitigated that by using things like helper text and um, using like a hand cursor when you're allowed to click on things, stuff like that. Okay. So uh, one of the other biggest problems that we had, or I, say, I would say the biggest problem we had, uh, is that our target audience and us are completely two separate groups. Um, we're targeting eight to 13 year olds in Ghana um, you know, we're college students in the United States. There's this complete different cultures. And so we had to do a lot of research to make sure that our game was connecting to this audience. Um, and I think we did a good job. I think we could do a better job. Um, we don't know. We didn't, we didn't get to play test with their, our target audience. So unfortunately, we um, aren't 100% sure that this game is going to connect to these people. 
Um, and another challenge is, you know, making play meaningful, again, just because of the culture of disconnect. Okay, so things that went wrong. Um, our communication was really good, but we never sort of uh, talked about deadlines for things. We would say, oh, we will have this done by the end of the week, but then, you know, somebody would need the art assets and it wouldn't be done, sorry. Or um, someone, you know, we would want to play test the game at a certain date and the, there wasn't a running game at the time. Um, so I think one of, the pro one of the things that we had a problem with just making deadlines, making sure people were doing things um, on a timely manner. Um, and then we were having good communication, just not constant communication. Uh, we were using several tools, but unfortunately, um, I think that's the next slide. Yeah, we were using like Trello, um, meaning weekly. Uh, we did use Slack. Unfortunately, not everyone was on Slack, not everyone was using Trello, and not everyone was able to go to the weekly meetings. And so sometimes, you know, we would communicate with three-fourths of the team, but, you know, there would be two people that were completely out of the loop. Um, so things that went right. Uh, we did separate our team into basically two different sub-teams. There were four people coding, um, and then we had, like, uh, me and Liz were doing the art, uh, she was doing character art, I was doing background art and assets, or all the other assets. Um, then we have like someone doing the narrative. Um, and so just by separating the team, it kind of made things a little easier. You know, you didn't have eight people touching the code and breaking things. Or, you know, five different people making this art for something and having completely different styles. Um, we had a meeting every week, pretty much. Um, not everyone was always there, but it was very useful to just get up to date on what everyone was using, uh, doing. Um, and then something that we did early was just cut a few features, like we cut a fourth mini game that was uh, picture matchmaking. Um, it just didn't really make sense, and so just completely cut it. Um, just cutting things like from a, like the uh, <laughs> extra or choosing where to to dispose of your waste. Uh, something that we did early on that helped us. Okay. And so then, uh, moving forward, things that we would want to do is just test the game more. Um, we would have loved to find a tar or someone familiar with our target audience, or to play test with our target audience, just to make the game better. Um, then you know, changing things like difficulty and make sure the game is culturally culturally relevant. Um, I know, like I, I would want to play test more and then change some of the art assets that I don't think they're too great right now. Um, and then, even for going further, just expanding the game and making it more interesting. Having more mini games um, and having more uh, like an interesting mystery rather than what we have right now. Thanks. Any questions? Put it in comments. <laughs> I didn't think so. Okay. Um, the, the demo that you did mid-presentation. Um, you might want to rethink how you do that. Um, again, you're going to have somebody playing the game anyway. Maybe you can put some of, that, um, some of that description while they're playing the game. Maybe you just demonstrate the, the map and say, here's a mini game, and then you'll see these mini games in play, blah. Um, or if what you're trying to do is just help us understand what the, the games are, just give us a screenshot. Mm -hmm. That's probably enough. Um, I don't, I don't think we needed it when we were watching the presentation to understand what you're we talking about. I think you did a pretty good job of that uh, when you're talking about individual things. Um, and then my big question was, um, what I'd like to know more is, you mentioned the, 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 the big thing is being, you know, the research you did for um, cultural appropriateness. Yeah. What was it? Tell us what you did in the, in the presentation. Like, did you, like, just maybe, maybe even give it its own slide. I think it's pretty important. The, the social hierarchy example was a very good specific example. We need more of those. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. So what changes you actually had to make once you realized there was a problem and you know, you've got it in this umbrella category of sort of cultural issues, but the specific stuff is really cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's it for me. Uh, so? No, I think Rick actually got most of what I was you might want to move the tools slide before what went wrong because of the way how the things worked out. Um, you know, just cover that first. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, <laughs> the, wa the water filtration back, uh, pick, 
picture where you say you can see it in the background? No, we can't see it in the background. It's, it's, it, your background for that particular slide was totally invisible on this projector. So uh, uh, increase the contrast on that image or actually put in it as an inset. Um, you two need to warm up before you present. Uh, your voices get louder as you speak, so practice outside or something, warm it up, and then you, you are more audible. Um, and uh, this is more of a game design thing. There is a bucket right next to the well and when you fall, while you are trying to find a bucket. And every player is going to say, why isn't that bucket just good enough? <laughs> So stick, stick a hole in the bucket or something. I don't know. <laughs> what if it's the easiest way to solve that problem? Yeah, that's pretty much all I had. Yeah. OK, cool. thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right, last up, cholera control. All right, hi, everybody. We're cholera control. Um, we're going to make this really simple. Uh, our game was about cholera, and it is a strategy game. You have to sort of manage many villages and try to tell them what they should implement in order to help uh, prevent cholera within their village. And so we're going to just go through uh, what went right, what went wrong, what we learned, and any future changes we would make. So firstly, what went right? Um, the sim like first thing that we, well, what happened over the course of the class is we simplified the game, and that was one of the best decisions we made that was really hard to do. Adjusting scope is really challenging because there are a lot of things you want to have in your game and you want to happen, but when you realize you just can't do it, it's like a load off your shoulders and you can really focus on the things that are important. Uh, and one of the things we did simplify is what the player can do. They have less actions, and we'll show that when I when we have some screenshots. Um, but they're more meaningful. Uh, what, the player doing, what the player is doing has a bigger effect on the game, and so they don't feel like they're just kind of clicking buttons. They're actually thinking, they're strategizing, rather than just, oh, I need to like, click these as fast as I can. And it's also more fun for the player. They don't have, there's not too many. There's a just, just enough. Uh, the iteration was really one of the other things that went really right. It was the best experience in the class as a whole for changing the game is, when you do that iteration, it feels really good when you look back and you see like, wow, look how far our game has come. Look at the changes we've made. And comparing those really helps you realize like the choices we made are good or some of them are bad, but most of them are good. And we also had design meetings that were occasionally a struggle for everyone to attend, but when they did, they were really productive and really helped the, the group know what was going on, know what would had to be done. And lastly, this, the huge design change we did sort of halfway through the class, uh, halfway through the eight weeks, we, this is what it originally looked like when we had a full, um, a full digital prototype. It was really confusing. There were, there were four villages, they had little bars over them, people didn't know what that meant. There's this text in the top corner of the screen that you can't read and you couldn't even read when it was full screen that told you your money and the population of each village. And then those two buttons that people weren't really sure were buttons. So that was really difficult. And um, this is what it looks like now. It's much clearer. There's a nice bar at the top telling you your money, your, how many days, and a nice little pause menu. And then there are only four villages. They take up the whole screen. It's very obvious that you want to click those. And also, there's a lot of indicators as to what's going on in each one. Like before, you had to click on each village, and then up in the corner, that text would change to tell you what's going on in that, that village. And now you can see it just like as a quick overview when you're watching. And so you have the, the population that's sick and that's not sick, and the uh, green bar is healthy and red is infected, and then an arrow telling you the, with the direction in which the infection rate is going, whether it's uh, going towards people get, more people getting healthy or more people getting sick. And then you also have those little circles beneath each locality, or we call them localities. It's a better term than village. We wanted it to be very neutral, and that's what our clients told us we should use. And so below each locality are those four little bubbles that show what, uh, what you've implemented there. And they, they count down. You might not be able to see it. It's a little small on the screen, but um, they count down and become like less colored in or a little bit darker so you know how much longer it'll last. And then for the menu of when, when you clicked a village, that's what it originally looked like. and It was really hard to read. There were a lot of 
a lot of choices that you could do. We had like eight, I think, is there, which at first we were like, yeah, this is a strategy game. It's going to be really hard. There's going to be a lot of choices, a lot of things you can do. And this ended up being very poor choice. And so this is what it looks like now, where it's much clearer, of, first of all, how to close it, how to get back to the main screen. Also, what you can do uh, when you hover over something in the description box that it's description pops up and if something had been if something's implemented which nothing is in this uh, locality but if something was implemented uh, that circle would also be colored in and counting down to how long until uh, you can implement it again so then uh, what went wrong first thing was coding working together is really hard and you know we learned this over over the projects, but so we thought, okay, we'll divide everything up, we'll make it so everyone can work independently and make sure there aren't any like real dependencies that are gonna be roadblocks. But even doing that, it's still hard when you have to bring everything back together. And there were just inconsistencies, people had different coding styles, and merging just took a lot longer than necessary than like it should have taken. Uh, motivation was also a really big problem. At the beginning of this project, people weren't really passionate about cholera or making a game about cholera and even as we came up with like designs and interesting choices and things we thought would be fun that passion just like didn't grow it was always just like i don't want to do this which is really hard i don't know how we could change that but uh also just the topic it was really restrictive and you know it's it's something that probably that i'm guessing must happen a lot in the real world is sometimes you work on things you don't want to work on but you have to find a way to struggle through that. So uh, we also had crunch problems. Our team was just like a lot of crunches. There isn't like constant work, there was a lot of crunches. And so we had a lot of crunching right before a play testing class. We had a lot of crunching after Thanksgiving um, before now. And the work on the game was really like low priority because you know everyone has other classes that they need to do things for. Uh, and so it's, it is hard to tell people like, no, you need to do this because they're like, well, I, you know, I have, I have a thesis project due. Like that's way more important than a project for this class. Um, and another thing that happened sort of over time is that people weren't adhering to the communication we agreed on. We said, okay, we'll do emails and we'll use Gitter, which is uh, sort of tied in with GitHub. And then people weren't on the Gitter or they didn't reply to emails. And so whenever you sent out a message, it was like throwing it out into the ether and then hoping people would respond, which is really challenging. And you know, sometimes you forget to log on to Gitter or you forget to look at an email until later. So it's difficult, it's something that happens, but it's a hard thing to deal with. So then what we learned within game design, there's actually a lot we learned from this project. Um, the biggest thing is that more complicated and more choices does not equal more fun. It can, and then if you're making a really big strategy game, I, I, like uh, Civilization, I could see where you'd want to have the ability to do a lot of things. But in something simpler, it, it, you don't need to be able to do as many things, but if those things have meaning, which our choices now do, it's a lot more fun. And playtesting revealed that a lot of people didn't like having so many choices. They didn't know what to do. There was that, you know, it was real time, so there were, like, people were dying, and they're like, I lost the game, you know, before I even felt like I started. Um, design is very restrictive. You need to pay attention not only to what the client wants, but also who you're making this for, how accessible does it need to be, uh, who's the target audience, and you also, it's really hard as a designer to realize you need to put both the player and the client's needs before your own. You as a designer know, like, I, I have this grand vision of what our game should be, but then playtesters say, we don't like your vision. You need to change it. It needs to do this. And your clients say, we don't like your vision either. It needs to change. You need to do this. And so doing that is very hard as a designer, but you know, we learned to do it. And the game was better as a result of it. Uh, some other things is none of us knew about anything about cholera when we started. So we learned a lot about cholera. And it's surprising how easy it is if you just wash your hands. It, that's, that's it. So if you're getting Ghana, just wash your hands, guys. And you know, probably don't drink infected water sources, but the big one is wash your hands. And that also applies to a lot of other things, and that's um, Pablo actually asked us to emphasize the washing your hands, because Ebola also, it benefits if people you know, wash your hands. It helps you so you don't catch other diseases. And then about coding um, is tweening and other animation APIs make a game look more polished for little effort which is something we didn't really implement until the end. And then when we did, we're like, wow, that looks a lot better. 
and then future changes. So for just uh, within the game, things that we never got to implement but we really would like to are subtle effects that would force people to change their strategy because sometimes it can get really easy and so we'd want to make it so people who quickly figured out a strategy and then wanted and um, think like, oh, we can win, is we wanted to make something that you know, their strategy doesn't work anymore. So we originally had the idea of uh, change in season, which is something we would like to do, but you know, time constraints. Um, or sort of like random events where, uh, you know, there was like maybe not a change in season, but there happened to be a really heavy rain one day, so everything flooded, and so now like, you know, all the water sources are more infected. Uh, also multiple levels of difficulty. We did like simplifying it, but there are still some things we'd like to add, at least one more action and maybe a few more villages. Um, and so that's something that we would like to add if we had more time. And also more advanced infection models. Uh, you can talk about the infection models if you want, but. Uh, uh, I guess, yeah, I'll chime in there. It, it turns out to be really, really hard to balance like the spread of an infection of a disease. It's like almost impossible to make the game relatively simple at the beginning, but then at the right level of difficulty at the end, because the nature of infection is that it's exponential and that just like you change a parameter by nothing, it just swings the whole thing over like it makes it makes a game go from very easy to completely impossible and so that made it like really really hard to balance and um, if I had more time like if I had a few more weeks to work on it probably the thing I'd want to work on would be work on something more advanced like some more advanced mathematical models uh, as opposed to just a simple exponential model that we currently have because that can make game balancing much easier because I had a really hard time um, balancing infection. And lastly some things we'd change for the class is we would wish that we had something that enforced the sprint task list. We submitted it every week, but we were never held to actually doing what we said we were going to do. Um, so yeah. that f it felt very just like, just, you know, like, oh, it's something we have to do. We have to say we'll do things this week in order to be working on the game. So we wish there was something like the instructors asking, like, okay, can we see your completed sprint task list? Um, the restriction to the Red Cross topics was a huge constraint for the creative freedom, especially for the last project. So because, al because all of us didn't really like the topic to begin with, it, it was a really long eight weeks. And so we wish that we didn't have to do that, but you know, I understand for this, this semester, this class, that was what happened. And then um, another thing is that we wouldn't work on an educational game regarding an unknown culture for the final project because it was just really hard to understand, okay, what do people in Ghana find normal? What would they want in a game? Do they understand how this works? It's something that's even hard because there are a lot of assumptions people who make, who've played games make about games that's really hard to get over. And so doing that for the final project that also has to be an educational game, that also has to be about cholera, and it's just like there are a lot of things piling up that made it really hard to do. Uh, yeah, so then any questions? And we'll also show a demo of the game, but if you guys want to ask any questions first. I, I, um, the, both, both, both on this screen and with some of the earlier teams, um, your, uh, many of you are using are running off Mac and you are using um, a screen resolution that's better for your screen than for the projector. So it's actually rescaling it to fit the projector, uh, which means actually uh, every pixel that you're drawing on, on screen is actually too small for the projector and things get blurred out. Um, in the screen resolution settings and system preferences, you can actually select whether you are scaling it best for display or best for, yeah, optimized for either display or okay. Or in, I guess in this case, you are optimizing it for the display. Which resolution are you using? It looks like you're using 1600. What's the best one? Uh, that, that's on the board right behind you. There's a widescreen and a, and a um, 4.3 version. So check that, those. because you're losing a lot of visual detail um, when you're sca scaling it like that, and it makes your games look worse. That looks way better. Yeah. And the color scheme is going to be better too. Yeah, your colors do look better as a result. OK, cool. Um, awesome. So um, we still have a little bit of things to iron out. Um, but uh, yeah, so the idea of the game is that you manage these villages, cholera is spreading, and you have to use various like prevention measures to stop it from spreading further. 
Um, so when the game starts out, there's just one village. Uh, people were having difficulty figuring out that you could actually click it, so I made it like do like that, so you know you could click it. So you click it, and then there's like various options that you can use to uh, stop the spread of cholera. So it's just the first village, so I just go with soap, which is the cheapest option. Um, and that usually stops, I'll make it go faster. So once you, like the first village is sort of a tutorial, like once you figured out how everything works and you're able to stop the infection there and you cure it, then a second village pops up. And as the game goes on, more villages pop up, up to a total of four villages. Um, basically, at the beginning, it's quite easy. Like you, you can't really lose on the first village unless you sit and stare at it and do nothing for like three minutes. Um, so, uh, but the second village comes up and now you sort of have to think about things and then you get an idea of how the game is actually played. By the time the third village comes up, you really need a strategy or you're going to lose. And the fourth village, like, it just gets really, really hard. Like, you generally, most people actually fail in the third village. Don't make it to the fourth one. But uh, yeah, I guess if you guys want to see uh, more gameplay. Um, so we don't have sound right now. Oh. We're going to add that in today. Um, so like, the three different options, basically, like soap is a cheap all-around option because we want the takeaway of the game is soap is overpowered, <laughs> um, basically. Um, and then sort of the, these two options distinguish themselves in that water containers are good for stopping an infection from spreading, but they don't cure anyone. And electrolytes don't stop anything from spreading, but they immediately cure just a percentage of the infected population. Um, what we found is that, like, I thought electrolytes weren't actually going to be fun, but then they are. Because at the end of the game, when the infection is like all over the place and everyone's dying, you just keep spamming electrolytes, or like, based on, it has a cooldown, so you can't just keep spamming. But you spam it as much as you can to desperately stay alive. Um, I don't know how far to actually take this set. Yeah. That's, that's fine for us. I know the live player is going to play it like on their own, yeah. so they'll be figuring stuff out. And yeah. again, give them a couple minutes, and then you can start talking if you'd like to talk over. Yeah. Um, for the presentation itself, when you started out, um, we could use a little bit more context about what you're talking about. You kind of just throw us into what went right, one of the things that went right. So maybe telling us what you're going to talk about might be a, a way to give t context for the full presentation. Would it be better to start, like, with starting with the game kind of give a better idea, or even just... That would be, a, that would be, one, that, that would be good, mm -hmm. um, especially if you're talking over the game and talking some, about some of the design, then we can kind of call back. Um, another context related issue is you refer to your client yeah. and you refer to the game but you don't, and you refer to making a game about cholera, but you don't actually explicitly state who your client is, what your game is for, what the goal you were trying to create your game for, what specifically it was. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can gather it from context, but it's a nice thing to have up front. Yep. Um, so the, the early slides, um, they're pretty wordy. Both of you are actually really good speakers, so I, um, I feel that you can get a lot of those points in your actual verbal, uh, you, you did in fact get all those points across in your verbal things. The slides don't need to also restate every single thing, so just stick to the sort of the, the high level hitters. Mm -hmm. um, but the way how you're actually presenting these points are coming across very clearly verbally, and the words are kind of starting to distract a little bit. Yeah, like each one of those could have been just one slide plus an image. Yeah, that, and, that, and that, will, that, that, that becomes a backdrop to the things that you're actually saying, which are actually coming across quite clearly, and you don't really need all of that um, additional visual noise. Um, especially when you have sub-bullets, like you have a heading, and then you have like tiny little sub-bullets underneath. Those sub-bullets, just say them, don't, don't oh. present them. Um, the, the image where uh, of the uh, selecting which upgrades you have for each uh, locality, mm -hmm. uh, right now you have like the blank uh, rectangle with no mouse over text in it, nothing is lit up. Okay. Um, if you just replace that with a screenshot of some things lit up, some things not lit up okay. with the mouse over text, it'll be way more informative than one mm -hmm. slide alone. Um, when you're talking about the balancing uh, the infection rate, as a, that's a really good detail case example. Uh, you know that, that 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 I just want to call that out. Uh, like that level of detail is neat because you're talking about really something very specific. Uh, and other things that you can talk about about uh, uh, I, I'm trying to remember um, the way how um, you had set up a communication system of using emails and Gitter, and this is what Gitter is, but people weren't responding and that was good, that was very specific. That was like, like these are the things that, uh, this is the way how something specifically broke down. And you know, um, you can talk about how things eventually got resolved, uh, will be nice, but 
maybe it didn't get resolved, and you can say that too. But, but those, those, that level of specificity was nice. Um, one more, uh, specifically on the slides, we talked about how you did iteration. Um, you talked about how you made changes and you stayed very generic there. Mm -hmm. Having some actual specific examples would be really what I'd like to hear. What are some things that you dropped? What are some things that you had in the beginning but you changed a whole lot and they're still in your, they're in your end game but we may not recognize it from the beginning game because it, it got changed and iterated on. But just, you don't even need a whole lot of examples, just one or two specific mm -hmm. ones to tie it back. Yeah, so, so if in that particular section you just added like here's, here's a specific feature that got changed in this particular way, mm -hmm. that, that's great because, because uh, you clearly have that information. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I think that's, that was All right. Cool. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So thank you all, everyone. Sorry we ran a little bit late. Um, but timing wise, everything looks like it went out. Tech wise, it looks like we've got most of our stuff figured out. So, a um, couple points of order. Um, this did go long. It's probably going to go about a full two hours on Wednesday. Do you want to take a break midway through? Would you like an intermission midway through? I'm seeing some nods. So we're going to put an intermission midway through. Um, lastly, so um, based on the number of speakers that we've got um, like, and the, the topic matter that we're talking about, I think what we're going to do is start with SNAP um, because we'll get everybody out of their computers out from the get-go and then we won't need that again afterwards. So just take care of that right there. You're going to have people playing live in the audience. Um, then we're going to go to Hello Wave. So basically, the swap, Heat Wave, and Snap. Okay. And swap, yeah, Saving Gora Gora and Cholera, swap those two. Yeah, swap those two. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, and for that, mainly because we're going to have lots of speakers at the end. So that'll just make it so that you're doing all the moving around. Um, color control, are you, and you're going to have two people for that. So we're going to make sure we have two microphones for all of that. Um, we'll have the intermission right after Heat Wave. So that's about an hour and a half, and then we'll have another hour. Um, and then that's the end of the class on Wednesday. Um, anything that's, else? That's, that's order of it. So that's the order of presentation right there. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five. There you go, cool. Um, trying to think of is there anything else that I should get to before we release you. Nope. Um, student evaluations, web.mit.edu slash student evaluations. I'll write the URL. Uh, student evaluation. I'll write up the real URL right there. Please do that um, in class today if you could. Thank you so much. You're actually you're doing a really good job. I really like these presentations. I'm really excited to see what they're going to be like on um, Wednesday. And I was really happy to see working games today. So aces on you for that.